Oh. Yes. I think we're live. We just went live Ooh. in the top corner. So this is this is it. I'm waiting for the big signal, everyone. Um, but <laughs> I think we're good to go. So this is our first Google Hangout that we've ever had. Um, and beside me, I have Joy Fielding, author of 25 titles. Um, her current one is Someone is Watching. Ooh. <laughs> and on the screen, we have Paula Daly, new author of The Mistake I Made. Hello. We also have Jean Finn, who is the author of The Scent of Secrets. And the reason we brought everyone together is because we're talking about suspense novels today, women writers, and we wanted to get everyone together um, on a Google chat. But because Paula and Jane are in the UK, we thought this is an easy way. We'll just have them dial in. We'll have Joy come in. She's in Toronto. So do you guys want to say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. <laughs> hi. Yeah. Awesome. Do you guys want to talk about your book a little? Maybe, Joy, you can start with your new one, which uh, someone is watching. Sure. Uh, someone is watching is the story of a, of a woman. Actually, she's a private investigator for a law firm, and she is um, raped and beaten one night on the job, oh. and basically the effect that this has on her, she retreats to her apartment, and... Uh, she starts really spying on her neighbors with her binoculars a la rear window because she's uh, a little, you know, she doesn't want to get too close to anybody and this is sort of what she does anyway. So that she then, in the course of uh, her spying, uh, fixates on, on one man in an apartment across the way and begins to suspect that he may be watching her as well. Awesome. And Paula, you're up next. Do you want to talk about the mistake I made? Yeah, the mistake I made is basically uh, the same premise as Indecent Proposal, but reimagined as a thriller. So that we, we have a character, Roz, who's in a real financial mess. She's terrible with money. And at a party one evening at her sister's house, um, a stranger offers her a way out and says, you know, for one night with him, he can solve her financial problems. But of course, things don't go to plan. <laughs> nope, not at all. <laughs> and Jean, you're up next. Do you want to talk about The Scent of Secrets? Yeah, The Center Secrets stars um, or features Clara Vine, who is an Anglo-German actress in pre-war Berlin, and she is um, acquainted with the Nazi elite, particularly the wives of the top Nazis. But she is, in fact, um, spying for British intelligence. And in 1938, which was a kind of seminally important year um, in the build-up to war, she is asked by British intelligence to make contact with Ava Brown, who was um, Hitler's secret girlfriend, not known at all about in Germany at the time, and to see if she can find out through Ava Brown what Hitler's plans are for war. So this is, um, this is a setup. It's almost an impossible mission, she thinks, but she does get some results. Yep, she does. <laughs> um, I want to encourage people that are watching live to use the hashtag PRA author chat and you can ask questions. I've got my phone here. I was telling the ladies before we got on here, the obnoxious person that's looking at my phone the whole time. So as your questions come in, I'll be watching them. So send them in and we'll be asking them to these authors. Um, I think that one of the things, like all the different premises that you guys talked about are is suspense. And I looked at the definition of suspense as I was preparing for this chat. Um, and where did I write it? I the definition of suspense is a state or condition of mental uncertainty or excitement usually accompanied by anxiety, which I think applies to all three books. All are very different, but all are very suspenseful. Um, so do you guys think that's an accurate description of your book, anxiety or uncertainty? All those different things are a definition of your book. Do you think it's suspenseful or would you say it's more thriller or... Well, uh, well I think it's a bit of all those, I mean, I think life, <laughs> you, you were describing that, and I thought, my God, that's my life, uh, you know, it's full of tension and anxiety, and, mm -hmm. you know, otherwise you're basically dead, and uh, I <laughs> I think that the books, uh, you know, deal with, with mm -hmm. you know, certainly, um, I've yet to read the, the other two books, and, and uh, I look forward to them, actually, yeah. so, but my book is, is really, um, I, I think it's really, it is quite suspenseful, I, I guess you would also describe it as a thriller, uh, but it's it's very much grounded in reality. One of the things I really tried hard to do was to capture what it is like for a woman who has 
has been assaulted in this way and and really the you know because so many books that I read or movies that I see things like that the with this awfully quickly you know they have yeah, this brutal attack and then two minutes later they're out on the street or they're fighting you know they're whatever and I thought well no you know I was bitten by a couple of dogs once <laughs> and it took me a year to you know before I stopped having flashbacks yeah. with these dogs coming at me so I I think that you know, I just wanted to show the reality of this situation. Yeah, I think that the attack for me reading it, even like as a woman, I was like, wow, that's so graphic. But at the same time, it's true. I've, I've never experienced that, thankfully. And I'm saying, like, when I was reading, I was like, she had to go to that place to make it. So, like, I felt anxiety, and that's not something I feel all the time when reading. So, I job well done. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Do you, do you think that's an accurate description of your books? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, yes. I mean, for me, for me, suspense is a really important element. It's what keeps the reader reading. And I was choosing um, a time when the world was full of suspense in the run-up to World War II. People were really wondering what was about to happen, and would Hitler actually go ahead with his plans to um, invade the rest of Europe? And to, so, it was a very suspenseful time. And to add to that suspense. I have Clara, who is, um, to all intents and purposes, to the Nazi elite, one of them. They think that she is a friend, um, she's a sympathizer, but of course she's not. So there's a suspenseful feeling that, will she be found out at any time? And so I like those two kind of, those two feelings of suspense running at the same time. The background, which is brooding, it's tense, and could go any way. Um, and the foreground, which is Clara walking those mean streets of Berlin and Munich, watched all the time by Gestapo, by um, by policemen, and all the time having to bring her acting skills to the fore to evade detection. So yes, yeah. yeah, suspense is really vital. Yeah, definitely. And what about you, Paula? What do you think? I'm just thinking that before I started writing these books, I probably should have looked up that definition of suspense. <laughs> I never did that. Yeah, I'm looking at. I think when I'm when I'm designing my books, I'm looking to find like a central premise that will keep the reader turning the pages more and more and faster and faster towards the end. And it's that premise that I'm looking for. That that when I know I've got it, that's when I think right now I can write the book. And when I came up with this one, which was a steal, really. I mean, I was I was um, th I'm thinking about the the famous story of um, when. Um, Alien was pitched to Hollywood executives, and they were, they pitched it as Jaws in space, which I thought was fantastic. And I thought, <laughs> I if I could take um, you know one premise from one genre and switch it into another genre and, and make it a thriller, perhaps you know that that would be fun to play with. And I just remember with Indecent Proposal, you, there was a lot to go out there. I don't think the film has stood up particularly well, but I think the premise has, and that's what I'm looking for with the main character, as in. What would you do? Give them a central dilemma, and hopefully, um, you know, then you, if you put a normal person in that situation, you're thinking, well, what would I do? What would I do in that dilemma? And that's hopefully what what gives the suspense and keeps the reader moving through the pages quickly. That's what I'm looking for when I'm writing. Yeah, well, I definitely think you achieved that because I was on the edge of my seat the whole time I was reading it, and I was like, "What's really? going to that kind of stuff?" And I think the indecent proposal is a great comp because I think when I read it, I was like, "I kind of put Sharon um, Stone in this role, even though Sharon Stone is a little bit older now." But I, you know, that yeah. was what I was thinking of when I was reading her. Um, I, I think you're right as well about that, that question: "What would I do?" is so important, isn't it? Um, to <laughs> to <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> Not Sharon Stone. Keep going, Jane. Sorry. <laughs> what I was saying is that, that that question is the the question that so many novelists ask themselves. What would I do? And um, it's it's what propels the reader through the novel to be able to see themselves in the position of the protagonist and to be actually making decisions in real time, as it were. Yes. I know when I'm when I'm 
writing um, the novel, I I always put myself in the position of the of the main character and say, what would I say if somebody were talking to me this way? How would I react? What would I do? Mm -hmm. Or what what would I think I would do? Or how would I like to react? Because very often the characters are much cleverer than I am <laughs> at the spur of the moment like that. You know, they always find the right thing to say. And uh, but it it is something that you do. You know, it's it's you try and make the character as much you yeah. as, as you can. Yeah, interesting. Um, it's funny, yeah, because I really felt that was Sharon Stone. So my whole time that I was reading, Roz was Sharon Stone. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's not. Um, I think what I showed the covers earlier. I'm going to show them again um, because each cover has a. There's this one, and I just covered it up. Um, and then this one. And this one, and the reason I'm showing them again is because each one has um, a striking pose of a woman on the cover, and I thought that was a really interesting part. Um, there's power, strength, and a frightened look on each of them, and I wanted to know, did you always know that you were going to write each of these books in the voice of a woman? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah? I very rarely write in the voice of a man because... Mm -hmm. I have no idea of the way men think. I, I'm not convinced, actually, that they do. So uh, I um, I always write. You know, there are enough male writers out there. They can take care of their own. I really, for the most part, want to write from a woman's perspective. It's what I understand. Yeah. I don't think I'm that different from most women and uh, in terms of my thought processes. And uh, that's the point of view I'm interested in representing. What about you, Paula? What did you think? Yeah, there was oh, there was no way I could write this from from a from a male point of view. I don't well, I wouldn't know where to start actually. But yeah, yeah as Joy's saying, I I know women women who who are who I'm interested in. I'm I'm not so interested in representing the male point of view. I just think I can talk about women. I particularly like having women as bad guys sometimes because then that's more fun and that's not done so often. And to put sort of my thoughts and then twist them into a real nasty, horrid person. I, I love to do that too. I think that's that's mm -hmm. the extra joy of writing. Yeah. It, vill villains are always the best to write. They're the <laughs> most fun to write. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Jane? Well, I mean, for me, the female perspective was really the whole point because because I was writing about Nazi Germany and um, and Berlin. What we all know about the Nazis and Germany is the men and we know about the politics and we know about the kind of war and we don't know anything about the women so for me I really wanted to look at the women's lives to look at what it was like to live under that regime and also what it was like actually to be married or in a relationship with one of these people who are the kind of monstrous um, men capable of huge atrocities and I've never heard the women's point of view so one of the things I did was to read the uh, memoirs and the biographies and the letters of the wives of the Nazi leaders um, Magda Goebbels and um, Emmy Goering and um, Mrs. von Schirach and um, also Ava Brown's diary and try and sort of see what what they felt and I mean the um, the answers are really s astonishing because the level of um, recognizable normality amongst these women is, is, is quite a shock and you think gosh they're married to monsters and yet the things that they're talking about are really quite recognizable female dilemmas and um, my main my my heroine Clara was always going to be a woman because she's a spy and um, all the spies I've ever read about are men and I thought no because there were female spies in World War Two and I want I want to talk about them so um, and also she very much uses her femininity in her spying work so um, yeah writing as a woman was absolutely a no-brainer for me. Oh, very cool. Um, okay, so finish this sentence. I'll start with you, Joy. The key to a good suspense novel is whoa. Uh, <laughs> I I think it is it is uh, keeping the reader up all night basically. Why keep making sure that the reader doesn't want that has a really hard time putting the book down mm -hmm. if if it's uh, you know you want to make it believable and real. But you know I think you can create the most fun fantastic situation if you populate it with real people people that your reader identifies with they will go anywhere with you they will go on a mm -hmm. spaceship they will go you know 20,000 leagues under the sea it yeah. doesn't matter so what you want to do is create a real 
believable character, and then you you need the best suspense is the one that just keeps you turning those pages. Yeah, no, that's a great answer because that's exactly my experience in reading your novel too, all of these novels. So, what about you, Jane? The key yeah, to the key suspense, key novel. suspense is not knowing what comes next and suspending your disbelief because um, in Scent of Secrets, at the end of Scent of Secrets, there is um, a coup in the um, Reich Chancellery, in Hitler's Reich Chancellery, uh, which um, Clara becomes involved in. And we all know that Hitler wasn't, uh, wasn't assassinated in 1938 and he went on to fight World War II. But I wanted that feeling of um, could it really happen? Could he actually just be about to be overthrown? And so for me, it's believing against what you know to be true, you know, sort of suspending your disbelief. Good answer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and Paula, same question. Uh, for me, it's, it's great characters and a good author's voice. If, if, if the writer writes well, and I, I, will, I will follow them anywhere, I'm not as bothered about plot, to be honest. But a, really, a great character is who I'm looking for, and I want somebody that I can really root for. I also don't want the—I don't want it all on page one. I want to build. I want to follow a character first of all before the bad stuff starts happening to them, so that when it does happen to them, I'm I'm a, I'm, I'm a lot more bothered about it. So I want twists and turns all the way through. I'm not expecting it. That's that's what I'm doing. I think one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from somebody was it's not important for the reader to know, it's important for them to wonder. And, oh, yes. and I, that really helped me because you don't have to give all the information mm -hmm. at once. It's much more important to just give a tiny piece and then just keep giving tiny pieces. I, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think that's the fun is, 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 is starting off in the opening chapters, so the reader will go, oh, I don't know what to know about this person, I need to know what are they withholding, what are they keeping to themselves, and I love trying to put that puzzle together for the reader that raises questions when we start, so that they have to know, they have to know what they're withholding. Okay. Also, yeah. one, of the, one, of the great, one of the great fun things to do is to, is to lay your clues, which obviously all of us do in our plots and and to lay clues early on like a fuse burning that people might not notice at all when they happen in the first couple of chapters and turn out to be tremendously significant. I always love that to be able to kind of suddenly refer back to something that people barely noticed and it to be a really important plot point. I know in one of my earlier novels, uh, it was a novel called Grand Avenue and people ask about it sometimes and I say really Everything you need to know is in the first chapter, but nobody, of course, knows it at the time. Yeah, but it's yeah. all there. Yeah, that's so yeah. interesting. That's why we have like these author chats because it gives it the like behind the scenes kind of thing. It's so neat to find out all this information. Um, we got a question from Twitter, um, and it says, "What types of scenes do you find the most difficult to write?" I'll, let, I'll start with you, Joy. Oh, I always start first. I know. I'm so <laughs> <laughs> um, Let me see. What's what? Um, it's not. I don't know that I've. I guess it's. You've written a lot. It's a, <laughs> yeah. It's it's the middle of the book uh, that I find the most difficult because I usually have the beginning of the book quite mapped out in my head and I always know where I'm going so I know the end of the book quite well and then I get around you know after the first hundred or so pages and I think ooh I don't have anything joining these two these two parts I've got to now sort of create a middle I've got to get me from here to here yeah. and it has to all be part of you know it, it can't seem like it's a bridge it has to just sort of feel like it was always there so I find sometimes just this is just kind of keeping things like in that middle section mm -hmm. is is hard for me or harder. It's not hard to create the suspense, really. I and once I've got those characters, people always ask, "Where do you get your ideas?" Mm -hmm. And you know, who knows? I, you know, really, <laughs> it's just the way I think as writers, our minds work. We yeah. are, you know, the hard part is not getting the idea. The hard part is figuring out what to do with it. So for me the hardest part is always just trying to to figure out what what I want to do with this great idea that I have. <laughs> and what about you, Paula? Joy has just answered exactly what how I would have answered it. <laughs> oh God. I, I have 
I have a meltdown on page 100 every time I get to about 30,000 words and I think I have no book. I have this book is terrible. I don't know the only people. I don't know anything about them. I don't know how to get them. And I think those seem quite difficult to write because I think I'm just writing the action that is exciting and not doing anything. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, apart from, I do sometimes have difficulty with description because I write so, so quickly, I find that description slows me down. So often I'll just, I'll just open like more scenery here and things like that and then go back when I'm in a different mindset and I'm kind of feeling a bit more lyrical and I'll put that down, down there. Um, Jean, what about you? Well, if, if it's what's, what's kind of something that you find most difficult to write, which I think it was, um, yeah. it has to be sex. I mean, I'm sorry, it's the hardest, hardest thing to do. And um, the temptation is always to do an unsatisfactory um, sex scene rather than a satisfactory one. Because if you do a satisfactory one, it's going to be kind of... Um, the, the danger of tilting into cliche is too high, whereas unsatisfactory scenes are always um, are always kind of slightly more either amusing or kind of pleasurable to write about. But without any doubt, um, it's when they actually get into bed that is the hardest moment. So I try and keep it down. <laughs> I try to do it as well. I used to mention body parts because I have teenagers and I just think they would be they they'd never speak to me ever again. <laughs> exactly. You've got to sidestep the body parts. That's so true. But yeah. then, on the other hand, you know, euphemism is is so grim sometimes. You know, you it, it's always really hard. And and I always remember when I was say about fourteen, reading um, D. H. Lawrence, Women in Love, and just thinking, he just it's awful. I hated it. You know, it wasn't realistic. I remember him saying of a woman's. Um, when, you know, they're in bed together and the woman felt like it, she was swimming in the sea. Oh, I'm, sure like that. I'm sure it's not like that. The difficulty of getting it right is so hard and I can't think of any author I really, I really feel who's actually done it very well or correctly. I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll manage to think of one, but for me that's the hardest thing to write. You get, actually, when I read a sex scene in a book now, and I remember I used to love it. I, I, you know, when I was young and my father would <laughs> have all these, you know, My Life and Loved by Frank Harris and all these, you know, books that verged, you know, certainly more sex than I was aware of. And uh, I used to love to, you know, read all that sort of stuff. But now it's just like, oh, yuck, really? I, I don't want to know the deep. You know, I mean, I know enough. I'm, you know, a grandmother. So <laughs> I, I know enough of the details. So I don't really want to read about it in any great detail because it's kind of embarrassing and it's it's unnecessary yeah. and uh, it, it kind of takes you out of the plot. It, it's like watching sex on stage. Uh, yeah. It's one thing if you watch it in a movie, but when you watch it on stage, it's too personal. You're too, you really feel like a voyeur right. and you don't, you know, like when I was writing the rape scene, actually yeah. the rape was not difficult, but I took great care to make, make sure that it was not the least bit titillating because what I did not want was for the reader to be aroused by this horrible thing and really and so I I made it awful enough but without actually getting into real detail yeah. you knew what was happening you knew it was really unpleasant and hopefully you were not in any way aroused by it so I don't and any of the sex scenes actually that I have written in books have been as you said kind of funny or you know that's sort of what's going on inside the woman's head which yeah. is not always what the man thinks is going <laughs> on. We're rarely We're swimming. just having a very real <laughs> chat right now. <laughs> you know, poor thing. Well, <laughs> okay, so changing gears a little. Um, for me when reading any kind of novel, suspense, fiction, anything like that, the characters always tend to stay with me as a reader, especially, especially ones that like hook you. And I think each of these books for me like really hooked me as a reader. So I wonder from where you guys are sitting, and I'll start with Paula to give you a little bit of a break. <laughs> I was wondering, um, do characters stay with you, do your characters stay with you for some time? And or do you just say goodbye to them when you finish the story? After all the publicity and all that kind of stuff. But 
How long does the character stay with you? Not, not, not for long. For long. And, and, and to be honest, I find it I hard, hard, hard to listen when I'm already on the book. And I have to think of books from, you know, the last couple of books that get confused. Who is it? You know, so no, I'm, once I'm done, I'm done with them. And, and to be honest, I'm, I'm sick of them. I, I don't really want to think about them. <laughs> you know. Interesting. And Jane, what about you? Do you say goodbye or do they stay with you? Well, for it's so, it's so, I mean, I'm now writing the fifth and um, in, in Clara's Adventures and I'm in 1940 and I really don't know whether um, this is the point at which, you know, five is enough or whether actually she'll go on or whether I'll just take a break and, um, and you know, do something else for, for a bit. But, um, the great thing about writing a series where the characters repeat is that you can kind of build, you can build up the accretions of their, of their lives, and you can refer backwards and forwards. And and um, it's a great pressure as a writer to be able to refer to something that you were writing about in a book a couple, a couple of books ago, and know that at least some of the readers will have read that and remember it. And it's and it gives depth. I, so I really like that. Um, but um, on the other hand, you know, yeah, the desire to write a um, completely different set of characters is also pretty strong. Mm -hmm. I, I think with Clara Vi, like, seeing as how you've written now five novels, we're just getting book one next week, goes on sale here next week. Um, but there's so many, yeah, like you said, like you'd be building different layers on top of her, and so we're just meeting her for the first time, and I know as when I was reading, I was like, what a great character. So I'm so excited to see where she goes, because it starts in 1933, and now if you said yeah. you're in 1940, so that's yeah. awesome. I'm really looking forward to see how those seven years play out in her as an individual. Um, in fact, it starts in 33, and um, the second book is in 37. And and when I first thought, oh, I'll write the second book in 37, I didn't think, but I'm missing out 34, 35, and 36, which were fantastically <laughs> interesting years in, in pre-war Germany. But there we are. It's done now. So I ah, missed those years. That's okay. We won't do <laughs> What about you, Joy? Well, I'm more uh, like Paul. I, um, I when I'm done, I'm generally done. I uh, occasionally they'll linger a bit, but usually by the time, in fact, the book comes out, I will have already finished the next book, and so it's hard yeah. for me. In fact, like now we're talking about someone that's watching, and it's like, really, what happened in that book? Who are these people? <laughs> what, what, you know? I'm, I'm also You've moved on. I've yeah. finished the next book, and I've got a whole new cast of characters, and so. I tend to get very caught up in the people I'm creating at the time, mm -hmm. and, and the others, you know, they go, it's like, you know, okay, I'm done. Yeah, that's so interesting, because I know I have, like, so many different ones of your books that I read in university and earlier, and, and I would, I'd be able to tell you every character, but you, I would understand, oh. like, you'd have to just be like, that's done now, and I'm moving on to my next, and my next. Well, I have certain, you know, readers who talk to me, oh, you know, this character in this book, and I think, who? Yeah. Uh, I, uh, so actually, no, I, I think sometimes uh, the reader is really more aware of, of what you're doing, you know, in the same way that often you need other people to tell you what your book is, is about. Yeah. You know, as the writer, you don't always actually intend all the things that readers will get from your books, although when it's pointed out, you go, oh yes, obviously I, I did that, and I guess my subconscious was aware of it, but mm -hmm. certainly I wasn't. It's so interesting. It is. I, I think books often tell you more, you know, a great deal about yourself. You know, you don't necessarily, you know, things that you aren't necessarily aware of. Yeah. Um, another question from Twitter. Um, it says, it's from Karen FMA. And it says, do you know the ending of your story before you start writing? So, Jane, I'm going to start with you. And I know that you're writing a series right now, so it might not be the right, you know, um, you might have a hard time answering this. But with this particular book, The Scent of Secrets, are you able to answer that question? Yes, definitely. Yes, it's, 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 um, it's a thriller. thriller. I, I do I think, think it's a thriller. thriller. You, you have to um, um, plot, plot very, very close. And, and so, so I always have to hire plot, plot, plot worked out, out before, before, before start, 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 right, start, right, 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 right,
if if I if I wouldn't know if I don't know where I'm going, then I would panic each day. So I really need to know. I, I don't know everything, but I I need the basic plot down, and I need the the big the big plot points. I need to know what what I'm. Some, it gives me something to work towards as well. I think right. Well, I know I've got a few thousand words to play with until that, so I can have a little bit of freedom. But certainly the endings. I think endings are really hard, and even though I have my endings, they they're the bit that I usually take about a two week break before I write. I usually um, go back and edit the rest of the, the novel and really get to grips with where I am and so I can have this big final push for the ending. Otherwise, I end up a little bit exhausted and just peter out. So that's that's how I tackle them. But yes, I certainly know before I start that exactly what happens at the end. Yeah, I'm the same. I, I always know, if not the exact details of the ending, certainly approximately what's going to happen. Uh, and because I think if you're creating any kind of sus you can't create suspense if you don't know where you're going because you have to know what you're building toward and when you're creating suspense everything that happens has to be a little bigger than what's happened before and and you have to you know you have to be going in a certain direction and if you don't know where you're going you're just going to be kind of wandering around all over yeah. the place which means to me that you're going to be doing an awful lot of rewriting which I frankly would prefer not to do <laughs> so uh, I I do know where I'm going and and I build you know toward that again nothing's written in stone if it's not working or something else occurs you can change it yeah uh, you're the driver's seat that's right well, yeah. I mean, one time I wrote one book the wild zone where I actually wasn't I, I knew that all the characters and there were five main characters I knew they had to end up together in this motel room and that not everybody was mm -hmm. going to come out alive but I actually didn't know until I got them into the room who that was going to be mm -hmm. but I still knew I had to get them there and then this is what was going to happen That's so you do you do I think I I hear writers talk occasionally and they say oh no they just start and then they figure it out as they're going but that's just way too much work. Yeah, it sounds like a lot. You need some sort of skeleton. Yeah, to like you need to know. Yeah, I, don't I, think, I, I don't do it, but I'm just. I saying. don't think you really can create suspense without knowing where you're going. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I wrote down is each of your books deals with your characters having kind of a moral dilemma of some sort. Um, how did you decide what ethics and all that kind of stuff would be present and or not present at all? And is it all part of your writing process or did some characters' decisions surprise you? Because you were saying earlier that like, Whoa. yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot there in that question, I know. But I'm saying like in your, you said like sometimes a character will make a decision and you're not sh sure of like why they made that decision. Is that something that like happens often when you're writing or? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I've never been asked that before. <laughs> um, I, um, I don't know. I mean, I think you create a character. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, and I, I think to create a successful character, for me anyway, I have to know everything about that character. Yeah. You know, you my characters. Uh, when a character is not working, it means one of two things: either they're too passive, mm -hmm. and passive characters are boring, so they have to be the ones doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, uh, when you create a character, I ha they can't be born at the age of thirty. Mm -hmm. You know, if a character is not working and she say she's a thirty-year-old woman, the reason she's not working is because she was born at the age of thirty. I haven't created any backstory for her in my head, mm -hmm. so I have to know, for example, you know, who her parents were, what they did, what you know, if they were, um, you know, if he was a if the father was a doctor, the mother was a lawyer. Like, who were the who were the parents? What kind of childhood yeah. did did this? Did this girl have mm -hmm. uh, what you know? What shaped her? What formed her? So that when she, even if you, even if I don't give the reader any of this, I have to know it because that's what infuses, that's what invests this character with reality. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would also provide her with her moral compass and whatever. But, it, but frankly, that's not really something I ever really think about. I you know I don't think about her code of ethics or, yeah. or anything like that. Well, what about you, Paula? Because your whole book deals with like prostitution and all that that runs in there. That must have been one a hard topic to talk about. And two, how did you deal with the moral dilemma in that story? I thought what I I didn't really have thought about it. I created, I created him like um, um, and weaknesses and he was flawed. He was flawed. I, I didn't I did, think, um, think, 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 think I thought I thought how, how I was if some, if some situation what which would I, I, mm -hmm. um, I did 
I think think too much about what what was right and wrong. It's not my job. My job is to present a situation where the reader decide what 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 they think is what they think is right. And Jean? Yeah, more, yeah, more so the, the very, very hard, hard of um, a book about living in Germany and yeah. pre pre-war Germany and during the war is is. Uh, certainly it's about really the war, not just the big, big ones, ones um, that, that, that are about the run, run, like, like, like big and small, with Nazi secrecy, befriend Ava Brown with the intention of betraying her, but also, but also the moral dilemmas that everybody under a totalitarian regime experiences. Like, I was very interested, if you ever go to Munich in Germany, there's something called um, the... Uh, the Honor Hall, it's called in English, which is um, the was the Nazi, Nazi shrine for the soldiers, and so there were there were big kind of um, guards outside it, an eternal flame, and it was the kind of Nazi martyr hall, and everybody who walked past it had to do a, a Hitler salute, and right behind it is something called Dodge Alley, where all the people who didn't want to do a Hitler salute would just skirt around this and didn't have to walk past and they didn't have to salute. And it's now um, in Munich, this Dodge Alley has been picked out in gold paving because it represents a very small moral uh, resistance that people offer to the Nazis. So there were all sorts of little moral dilemmas as well as the great big ones about um, should you attempt to assassinate Hitler or should you um, should you inform on people? There were, there were little moral dilemmas. So, for example, Clara always um, carries things under both arms or in both arms so that she doesn't have to do the Hitler salute, um, you know, and, and just minor things like that. Yeah, I think moral dilemmas are, are sort of essential, really, um, or certainly if you're writing the, uh, my kind of fiction. Okay, last question, and it'll be an easy one, um, mostly because we're a book publisher and we're curious and book lovers are watching. What are you reading right now? I'll start with okay. you. Okay, uh, I actually just finished um, a wonderful book called Where Did, Where Did You Go, or Where'd You Go, Bernadette? Bernadette yeah. Oh, that's my favorite book. Yeah, yeah, and, and I just loved it. Uh, so um, I was recommended to me, and and I I loved it. So I, that's the the book that I've just finished, and I just bought this morning. I just bought Jonathan Franzen's new book, book Purity, and Erica John's book uh, Fear of Dying, and uh, I forgot his first name, Dewitt, the, the major Domo Spider, oh, Patrick Dewitt's yeah. new book. Uh, so those are the three I'm going to tackle next. Oh, great. So. Those are good choices. Yeah, hopefully, fall hopefully, hopefully, hopefully I'll <laughs> like them. What about you, Paula? What are you reading right now? Can I just say I adored Where Do You Go, Bernadette? That's one of my favorite books of all time, and I've just made recently made my daughter read it as well, and she loved it too. Oh. I've just and I can hold it up. I don't know. We oh, hang on. We can see it. Yeah, so it's Patrick Gale's The Place Called Winter, and it's um, set, I think, 1912, and I think it's set in Saskatchewan, actually. Um, but it's an excellent book. It's about a guy who has an illicit affair, and he has to escape the country rather than um, bring shame on his family. So really, really enjoying that. Um, trying to think, and then I've just got lots of proofs that, you know, that the publishers send to the <laughs> comments on, so I'm wading, wading through, through those. So, yeah, that's me for a while. Great. Jane, what about you? I have a to-be-read pile that is like six foot tall, and um, Jonathan Franzen is a big brick in the bottom of that wall. Um, I'm uh, simultaneously reading um, the new William Boyd book, which is called Sweet Caress, which um, does um, take a heroine across the 20th century, which is very interesting to me in some of the same areas. And um, I'm enjoying that. And also um, I'm reading the memoirs of just for light relief, the memoirs of um, Hitler's secretary. So, <laughs> well, that sounds like fun. yeah, that sounds like great. <laughs> a little hefty read there. Um, so I'm going to end and say thank you to all of you. And just one last time, we'll do a round robin kind of thing and just say where people can find you online so they can come and say hello and all that good stuff. And we'll start with you, Joy, in true fashion. Uh, well, I guess they can just they can visit my website, yep. which is joyfielding.com, uh, and they can write to me. Through that and whatever, and I'm I usually I answer all my emails personally. 
So uh, just please, open I'd, up. Love to, I'd love to hear <laughs> from you all. So. And Jane, what about you? Where can people find you um, online? You can um, indeed contact me through my website, which is Jane at which is janethin.com, and um, I'm on Twitter at janethin, and um, my email is jane at janethin.com, so it's all very, very easy. <laughs> and Paula, what about you? Uh, my website's under construction at the moment, so not, not live yet, but shortly. Um, but really, Twitter is the one I, I use the most, so it's Paula Daily Author, and I'm on Facebook as well. I'm on Twitter and Facebook yeah. too. I forgot to mention that. My daughter does my Facebook and Twitter because I'm like... Yeah, Facebook too, yes. Too much. <laughs> it's just too much. Well, thank you all for joining, coming in, watching this live chat. And for more, follow Random House CA on Twitter, Facebook, all the different social media platforms because we've got lots of more great stuff coming up. And thank you to all of you for joining. Well, thank you. I hope you'll look me up when you come to Toronto. Yes. Thank you. We had fun. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. bye. I think she did. What does it say on the It says live, but it's <laughs> live. <laughs> We've all said bye. I'll go check with her now. Okay. Awesome. One second. Can any of you hear me? I can hear you. Yep. You're still live. <laughs> we still are live. Okay. Well, when now you are in Toronto, maybe we can have lunch or something. It'd be nice to meet you guys. Great idea. I'd love